Today we're going to be talking about shell shock. No, not the synonym for PTSD or battle fatigue. We're talking about shell shock NOM 67. It's an old game from Eidos and Gorilla, published almost 20 years ago, and it just might be the best Vietnam game we've got. So let's get into it. Shellshock NOM 67 came out in 2004 on Xbox and PlayStation 2. It also came out on PC. It's the PC version I want to talk about today since that's the one I can actually play, though not without a little difficulty. See, you can't get a legit copy of Shellshock NOM 67 online from Eidos or Gorilla. You can't get it on Steam. There's no digital download from Eidos or Gorilla, which don't exist anymore. Short of getting a used physical copy, you can't get this game super legitimately, but you can still kind of get it. It's tricky. So Shellshock Nom 67 is what's called an orphan work or a piece of abandoned wear. Now, I didn't actually know anything about abandoned wear until I decided to pursue a replay of Shellshock Nom 67 now that I'm an adult in my 30s with lawn furniture and health insurance and bills. So many bills. Uh, Basically, abandoned wear is software that is ignored by its owners who are positively unreachable. These abandonware applications have no purchase availability other than used disks, which can be tricky to find. So, essentially, Eidos and Gorilla don't really exist anymore. And none of the companies that absorbed Eidos and Gorilla see enough value in Shellshock NOM 67 to make it available on Steam or their own website or anything. So you can't legally purchase this game anymore. The used disc market notwithstanding. The copyright holders don't really exist anymore. The software has essentially reached its end of life and it's being ignored by its creators and by its current ownership, whoever they even are. This puts it in really weird legal and ethical territory. It's not in the public domain but the owners of Shellshock Nom 67 and other pieces of abandoned wear and orphan works, they don't generally enforce their copyright because they consider the applications technologically obsolete to the point of having no commercial value. This is a shame, I think, because people would enjoy playing Shellshock Nom 67, and I think they'd be happy to pay 10 or $15 for it on Steam. But you can't. So your options are get a PlayStation 2 or an Xbox and an original used hard copy of the game, which is somewhat scarce. Or get a hard copy of the PC version on the used market, which per my understanding is even more scarce. Option number three would be to simply ignore the copyright, which the copyright holders, whoever they even are now, are also ignoring, which is what put us all in this fix to begin with. I'd rather give the hoppy, excuse me, I'd rather give the copyright holders some money for a supported downloadable option. It doesn't exist. So you want to play. You can't buy it, but you can still play. See, whoever owns the rights to Shellshock Nom 67 now really should monetize the digital PC version for nostalgic players, but until they do, myabandonware.com exists. Myabandonware.com exists. Enough said. Email me if you need some pointers. Uh, Before we get too deep into the jungle, I need to address something. I read your comments, all of them, to my own extreme detriment. (laughs) One of the recurring criticisms I saw in the comment section for my My LCP Saved Me video was some variation of, you could have told that story in two minutes or less. 
Guys, that's true. I probably could have. And the Godfather trilogy didn't need three films running over 10 hours total, which cost hundreds of millions of dollars and which spanned 20 years of production to tell its story either. Francis Ford Coppola could have produced a 58-second proto YouTube short in which a young optimist gradually compromises his idealistic vision for the future and ultimately becomes his father to the total devastation of himself and everyone he loves. But if Francis Ford Coppola would have done that, I submit for you that it would not have been worth doing. And it probably wouldn't have been worth watching. Now, I'm not so um, arrogant as to think that my videos are the godfather. My videos are not the godfather. My videos are trash. I'm conscious of that. But my point is that this is not the place for long story short. This isn't a TikTok dance. This is a place for long form, in-depth exploration of ideas and experiences. If that's not for you, God bless, consider watching something else. Okay, so Shellshock Nom 67. It's a third person shooter which takes place in 1967 during the height of the Vietnam War. While other conflicts, namely World War II and with the centennial recently, World War I, have gotten plenty of representation in games, Vietnam has been largely ignored by the gaming industry. There have been a couple other efforts that I'm aware of, like Conflict Vietnam or Black Ops, um, but they either are not really Vietnam War stories, as is the case with Black Ops, or they're unplayably bad. Sorry, Conflict, really did not enjoy you. Um, so the best we've got is this largely forgotten 20-year-old title. Now, it's not really a knock on Shell Shock, As we'll discuss for what it is, I think it's actually quite good. And in my judgment, it's misunderstood and badly underrated. So Shell Shock Nom 67 is a Dutch studio's take on the Vietnam War from a jaded, skeptical American perspective. It's pretty interesting. Now, the story unfolds from the point of view of Caleb Cal Walker, charting his evolution from cherry to hardened special forces operator during his tour of duty in the bloody year of 1967. Cal and his unit encounter horror after horror in a struggle that lacks purpose, causing some of them to lose themselves and become quite monstrous war criminals, which is actually something the player can choose to some degree to engage in themselves. Shellshock Nam 67 did not get its flowers when it came out. It received mixed to negative reviews and sold around 800,000 copies, which, while not a flop, kind of did leave something to be desired. IGN called it tasteless, and Eurogamer said that the game was a trivial representation of a bloody conflict for our own personal entertainment. I don't think that's the whole story, and I think there's reason to keep digging. The other side has an argument, and I'm here to put it forth. Whenever there's a huge disparity like this between critic scores and audience scores, Something has happened. There's a disconnect, and it needs to be examined. Sometimes it's not more complicated than snooty, proto-communist critics that are too far removed from the real world and its proclivities to understand and appreciate what middle America enjoys and why they enjoy it. Sometimes it's a case of an industry's solicitation of feedback from people outside the intended audience for a piece that end up disproportionately resulting in criticism. I think that's what happened here. Metacritic shows an aggregate score of 58 from professional critics for the PlayStation 2 version, but the user score is an 83. That's a huge gap. Now, I'm going to withhold my score until the very end of this video, but suffice to say for now that I do not agree with IGN or Eurogamer. Shellshock Nom 67 isn't 
tasteless. And it's not trivial. Critics simply didn't choose it back in 2004. And a piece like this has to be chosen in order to be appreciated. Drafted consumers aren't going to get it in the same way that a volunteer army of players might. What I'm getting at here is that it was the job of critics to play and critique Shellshock Nom 67. But this is a true war story. And true war stories have to be chosen. The game's portrayal of the Vietnam War isn't tasteless. The Vietnam War is tasteless. And that's Shellshock Nom 67's point. You have to choose truths that are this gruesome. Like if you enjoyed this game without also experiencing some agony, disgust, and reflective contemplation, I think that says more about you than it does about this historically immersive, brutal, and honestly pretty depressing story. Now, I'm not saying that Shellshock Nom 67 isn't without its problems, but to write it off as glib murder porn the way reviewers did 20 years ago is, I think, a gross misapprehension of what the writers and designers created here. This isn't bloodlust for bloodlust's sake. This is an honest attempt to capture the real lived experience of the men and women who fought this war. It's gritty and devoid of meaning and heroism. There's a sect of consumers who, I guess, want war to look like this. That's Hollywood. That's romance. It's a lie. Shellshock Nom 67 understands that, and it wants you to understand it too. It wants to shock and terrify you and leave you feeling empty with a satchel full of questions to which there kind of is no satisfactory answer. Shellshock Nom 67 wants you to understand war. Because it knows that nobody who understands war for the amoral, indiscriminate devastation that it is can maintain a healthy appetite for it. All true war stories are implicitly anti-war, in my opinion, and this piece is no different. A game like Shellshock Nom 67, through its unflinching brutality and refusal to moralize, captures the aesthetic of a true war story. That was a really ambitious an undertaking in 2004 by Eidos and Gorilla, and I think they deserve some praise for having the guts to put out an unsanitized, offensive, composite narrative of the Vietnam War. They didn't mean to tell a pretty or uplifting story. They meant to tell a true war story. If that phrase sounds familiar to you, congratulations. You may have gone to college, or at least you were a fairly advanced reader in high school. Let me jog your memory. In 1990, Tim O'Brien published a book called The Things They Carried, which chronicles a platoon of American soldiers in Vietnam. One of the stories, How to Tell a True War Story, offers a prescriptive guide to future storytellers. In it, O'Brien says, a true war story is never moral. It does not instruct, nor encourage virtue, nor suggest models of proper human behavior, nor restrain men from doing the things they have always done. If a story seems moral, do not believe it. If at the end of a war story you feel uplifted, or if you feel that some small bit of rectitude has been salvaged from the larger waste, then you have made, excuse me, then you have been made the victim of a very old and terrible lie. There is no rectitude whatsoever. There is no virtue. As a first rule of thumb, therefore, you can tell a true war story by its absolute and uncompromising allegiance to obscenity and evil. 
This story is not moral. It uplifts exactly no one. There aren't any heroes. The player isn't a patriot and he doesn't fight for God or freedom. He kills strangers in their homeland in order to remain alive in a world that he's aware may not be worth living in. He's aware of this and he hates it, but he keeps fighting and killing and existing anyway because he's as insane as the war itself and everyone who perpetuates it. It was William Tecumseh Sherman, Union general during the Civil War, who said, War is all hell. And that's what true war stories convey. Mankind is unique in its capacity to conduct warfare. No other animal does this. And it's the worst that mankind has to offer. It's indiscriminate and inexplicable. The violence, the pain, the suffering, the cost in terms of human life and human potential is unspeakable and beyond the capacity for rationalization. Shellshock Nam 67 captures this in its intro, which foreshadows the horror that awaits the player when they press start in a style that underscores the despair and bottomless dark that war leaves in its wake. The intro, intro and uh, menu design, the music, they all set the tone for this gritty, amoral experience that awaits the player. Shellshock Nom 67 drops the player character of Cal, then a total cherry, into Saigon, where he makes first contact with a fearsome enemy comprised of men and women, peasant farmers, and NVA alike, who really believed that they were defending their homeland from brutal authoritarian invaders. Almost right away, players kind of have to reflect on this. Would they really behave any differently if the shoe was on the other foot, or would a proud, courageous person anywhere take up arms against a foreign army telling them how to live and govern? Once players complete their objectives during this first mission, they're briefed on the next one, but then Shellshock Nam 67 does something subtle and important. Rather than transport players directly into another blood and guts, run and gun, jungle horror show, there is this experiential intermission wherein players are allowed to explore the base of operations for their unit. They can hang out on the range and do target practice. They can buy contraband, visit with prostitutes, shoot the breeze with other soldiers. It's all optional. But the set dressing here is important for immersion into this world. Here, Shellshock Nam differentiates itself from other newer games in a way that I find really pleasing. Players have a choice to be patient and let the game and time and place swallow them up. They can choose to explore the base and talk to people. They can choose to buy drugs and sex and contraband. They can choose the weapons that they take with them as they ready for the next mission. Or they can jump right back into the bad bush and bump heads with the NVA and partisan forces. The point here is that players have a choice. They can choose whether or not to engage with the atmosphere that the free roam base helps to create. And I think they should. Because it's part of the immersion in world building. It's an opportunity to lose yourself and forget about bills and deadlines and work and inflation. So much inflation. The base creates atmosphere. And that atmosphere helps to create a sense of total immersion. Players are transported from their living room or from their mother's basement into a faraway time and place, and they get the experience of a GI deployed to Vietnam rather than the information about what being a GI during the Vietnam War might have been like. This is show, don't tell 101, and it's really important. The music, the dialogue, the sounds, the texture, it all oozes Vietnam in 1967, and it begins to make connections to other texts. Shellshock Nam 67 is self-aware. It knows that it's in conversation with similar works, and it seems to treat this as a privilege. It engages with Platoon and the Deer Hunter and Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket. 
And it knows that it's paying homage, in a sense, to these movies and books that came before it. And it takes that responsibility seriously. O'Brien said that if you don't care for obscenity, then you don't care for the truth. And Shellshock Nom 67, if nothing else, cares very much for the truth. The ability for the player to buy and take drugs, the fact that he can choose whether or not to spend his time with prostitutes, and the fact that these things don't seem to ultimately ease his pain and descent into madness speak directly to the futility of going to war and trying to keep whoever you were before the two-way firing range opened up. Shellshock Nom 67 seems to suggest that once the fighting starts, the person you were before dies, whether your physical body survives or not. All you can do is waste money and waste time and worry and wait for death with your teeth and your fists and your feet clenched. Playing around on the base, talking to the guys, shooting targets, listening to the good morning Vietnam style radio man's black humor, it provides an uneasy reprieve between fighting that, again, helps to create the experience of anxiety and dread. Music plays over omnidirectional loudspeakers on the bass, and the DJ provides a backdrop of gallows humor that further immerses the player in the experience of a year in Vietnam. The track list is pretty excellent. Some high-budget choices are absent, but this doesn't harm the score overall, in my opinion. Paint It Black is a great song, and I love The Stones, but it's too obvious. Full Metal Jacket and Apocalypse Now use it more or less the same way, and it would have been a little too on the nose for Shellshock Nom 67. The design choice of giving players a choice extends into the gameplay during the second mission. Players can choose whether or not to commit war crimes, like killing the livestock of villagers who may or may not be collaborating with the enemy. Players can choose whether or not to murder the villagers themselves, and critically, the decision has weight. You feel something when you place your crosshairs on a civilian and pull the trigger. Shock and shame settle in almost immediately. We've been conditioned to believe that we aren't allowed to do things like this. The crosshairs in Shellshock Nom 67 don't go green and the fire button isn't disabled. The game lets you commit a war crime if you let you commit a war crime. Which speaks again to telling a true war story and doing it with some integrity. You can't tell a story about war without being a liar if it doesn't embarrass you, to paraphrase O'Brien. Shellshock Nom 67 doesn't force a sterile, HR-approved brand of ethics on the player. The story is true, spiritually, if not factually, and as such, it cannot be moral. The player can try to act honorably, but he's going to debase himself either way if he's going to survive, because that's what war means. This is seen during the second mission as tension builds in the village while you round up the villagers and search for weapons. It becomes clear that some or all of the civilians are harboring weapons for the VC, and when one makes a break for it, the player gets to see how quickly it can all go bad in ways we can't take back when the stakes are as high as they are in combat. Here a sense of mistrust is born, and it remains for the rest of the game. For the rest of the game, the player will see villagers and kind of can't help but wonder whether or not they're conspiring against him. That mistrust helps provide context for this whole mess, and it goes to explain, while not condoning, the downward spiral into apathy and murder that Cal's buddy Psycho experiences as the plot unfolds. Again, this is a true war story. But there are different kinds of truth. There are strict, documented, factual, actual truths, and then there are spiritual truths. There was probably no Cal Walker, no Psycho, no Ramirez, no Monty. These people and these fights under these specific conditions didn't 
really happen, but they serve as a composite that breathes life and experience, there's that word again, into the true historical events upon which Shell Shock Nam 67 is based. And it's that historical basis in truth that is the real strength of a story like this in terms of its capacity to educate. A third-person shooter has value. It's the best version of itself when it manages to get silly teenagers who don't care about anything other than breasts and baseball and chilling to care about history and art and technology. I'll personalize this a little bit. I quit school after the eighth grade, and I thought that's where my education would end. But Shell Shock Nom 67 and games and movies and books like it convinced me that expanding my knowledge base was kind of cool, which is like a really hard thing to do when you're 15 and aimless. Shell Shock Nom 67 reminded me of its importance in this regard during my replay, now that I'm in my 30s. I can remember searching the village for the first time almost 20 years ago and uncovering this weird-looking gun under the haystack, huh? What's this? Oh, a PPSH-41. Never heard of her. But damn, it holds 71 shots and it has a high rate of fire and it's pretty controllable. This is a way better weapon for fighting at close quarters in a jungle than the M14 that the army gave me for this mission. But no such thing ever really existed, right? So I do some research and, oh wow, the PPSH-41 was a real thing and the Russians used it to great effect to defeat Hitler and the Nazis. And they gave a bunch of them to Korea and Vietnam as aid because they were friendly fellow communist countries. Okay, wow, did not know that. Learning has occurred and it was kind of cool. Maybe I'll keep reading. Maybe someday I can be a custodian of this history and get myself a real PPSH-41. That actually has happened, by the way. Um, it's taken about six months and uh, it's cost me a lot of money, but I should be taking possession of my 1945 Molot PPSH-41 next week. So please stay tuned for that. Um, anyway, Shellshock Nom 67 tricked me into learning at a time when my teachers couldn't. It tricked me into caring about history and technology and iterative design. It got me interested in literature and art and weapons and the historical events that helped produce them. And these interests helped to develop me into a well-rounded professional and human being. That's not nothing, especially considering my negligible loser teenage past. Again, guys, I dropped out with an eighth grade education. The future was bleak. And I offer now Shellshock Nom 67 as one of the catalysts for my continued learning. And in that way, it's very clearly not the vapid, tasteless, bloody nothing that critics painted it as back in 2004. Shellshock Nom 67 came out before the recent scourge of political correctness that is really damaging storytelling in ways that I predict future generations will not be kind to us for allowing. This game understands that it's offensive, and it understands that it has to be offensive if it's going to be anything other than a liar. In this way, Shellshock Nom 67 and other older games seem to have an ability and a willingness to go there, to fully immerse players in the experience they depict. And that's not often matched by newer games, in my opinion. When I play a newer game, what tends to be my experience is that I'm playing something that was rushed and which is superficial and overly concerned with the online multiplayer experience and graphics um, over historical and narrative elements that I really loved in older games. Maybe I'm just being a nostalgic boomer fud, but it seems to me that we've sterilized combat and history and narrative in newer games and other newer forms of media. 
And I think it's honestly insulting to the consumer. It's insulting to our sense of history and our perception of reality. Take Call of Duty World War II, for example. It's this buddy World War II narrative that kind of disrespects the conflict and its implications by sanitizing history. There's this sequence that really underscores my point near the end of the campaign where the player character comes up on a concentration camp, but the camp is empty and bleached, and the suffering that characterized the reality of those places during that time is totally absent. It's cheap, and I resent it. Shellshock Nom 67 doesn't do that. We get to see war and all its murderous ugliness. So I've really propped Shellshock Nom 67 up so far, so far. I've tried to give it its flowers in ways that it didn't get 20 years ago, but I do have criticisms. Let's get to those. Gameplay. It's dated and a little herky-jerky. It's not meaningfully worse than other major, major titles of the day, but there are some invisible walls and some questionable design choices for uh, some of the levels, but it's easy enough to work through, in my opinion. A bigger criticism is the narrative. But wait, I thought you were all about Shellshock Nom 67 and telling a true war story and all of that. Okay, so while I really admire how this story is told in a way that never proselytizes, and while I love the way in which it eschews sentimentality, the character development leaves something to be desired, particularly as it pertains to the player character of Cal. He never really speaks, <laughs> and we never really see his face, or at least not very often. This is a storytelling tactic that was probably intended to let players put themselves into Cal's shoes easily, because his shoes could fit anyone. He's an everyman. Hooray! But that doesn't really work. It actually almost always has the exact opposite effect. You don't make your protagonist a generic everybody to get people to relate to him. They won't. It pretty much guarantees that they won't. Instead, you should make him as specific as possible. The more idiosyncratic character details your protagonist has, the more people identify with him because people are complex and nuanced. Subconsciously, consumers know that a human being is a complicated thing that varies widely from one individual to another. They know this because they are human beings. They know it without knowing it. If your protagonist has a very specific origin story, if they're from Weebaugh, Montana, and they wear a Mickey Mouse wristwatch, and they mispronounce Marine Corps, Marine Corps, and their nickname is Mule, well, those are really specific character details, and we can invest in those as readers or players. Shellshock Nom 67 doesn't give us this for the player character, and yeah, while I have a lot of good things to say about the game, it's a miss. It's a bit of a problem. Similarly, non-player characters are allowed to exist, but their evolution is subtle or absent. We see Psycho debase himself and lose whatever grasp on ethics or reality he may have had when he got to Vietnam, but it's definitely on the periphery. This isn't a huge problem for this particular story, which is more about shared suffering and search for meaning and reason in an unreasonable time and place than it is about the arc and development of any single character, but it's still worth mentioning. This story isn't exactly character-driven. It's more about the whole disastrous big picture than it is the granular details of each person's individual development as a human. But still, the decision to limit character development is kind of important and especially um, important as it pertains to the sort of wooden presentation of Cal, the player character. So if you wanted to call that out as a shortcoming, I think you'd be well within your rights. It's a super valid critique of Shellshock Nom 67. There are some times where Shellshock Nom 67 jumps the shark a bit. 
Uh, That phrase, by the way, comes from an old episode of Happy Days, wherein Fonzie finds himself water skiing in a leather jacket and jumping a shark. It was basically the beginning of the end of the show. Um, Anyway, there are moments where Shellshock Nam 67's desire to adhere to O'Brien's criteria for a true war story by presenting an absolute and uncompromising allegiance to obscenity and evil maybe go too far. When Cal and the goons come up to the fort near the end of the third mission, the horror show is on full display. It's not quite comical, but it feels a little removed from reality. We could maybe look past the heads on sticks. Such things undoubtedly happened. But when combined with the message written in blood and in English on the fort wall, it's a bit much. Kind of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 E. It's not unforgivable, but it's a little over the top. And these kind of cinematic hyper-exaggerations... They can pull us out of the experience a little bit. Another criticism is the special forces promotion gimmick. Go do this super dangerous kind of special mission. And if you survive, you're in. I'm pretty sure that's not how that works. But we'll suspend our disbelief. After all, what does a writer do when they don't know the details? Well, they make a good faith effort to conduct thorough research and exercise critical thinking so that they can get it right. But when in doubt, they just make it up. Ask Stephen King uh, about his suppressed revolvers or Shellshock Nom 67 about its uh, K98 rifles. I'm pretty sure those should be Mosin Nagants, but I digress. In the end, the player has survived. And Monty asks him if he's okay, and of course he isn't. He's a survivor, and he's left with a survivor's only real question. How do I make this matter? It's a question he knows he probably can't answer. What words or pretty ideas could ever give meaning to such destruction? War is insane. People are insane. God help anyone who looks for reasons. Kurt Vonnegut said that. So I owe you a score. Listen, this is an old game. The graphics and game mechanics aren't on par with recent titles. There's no multiplayer mode with endless games of team deathmatch. Um, So comparing it to recent titles in that regard, it's not even going to be close. But can I be really honest with you? Graphics and online multiplayer and game mechanics, those things have never mattered that much to me. A game's ability to convey experience through historical atmosphere and truth, its ability to tell a compelling story that provides context and understanding, those are the things that make me hungry to replay a game. That's what matters to me. It's why I went out of my way to jerry-rig Shellshock Nom 67 for a replay 20 years after its initial release. And it's also why I seriously doubt I'll ever replay Call of Duty World War II. Shellshock Nom 67, it gets an A. I'm going to give it a 91. 91 out of 100. So thanks for tuning in, guys. If you have questions about... Abandon where and how to get Shellshock Nom 67 up and running. Drop me a line. I can be helpful. Um, again, it's my hope that whoever owns the copyright to this um, stops ignoring it and makes it available uh, for a nominal cost, 10, 15 bucks. I think people would be happy to pay it. Um, until then, I think it's better that it be enjoyed. However, people can access it. Um, So drop me a line if you have questions. I'm happy to help walk you through it. Um, I want you guys to look out for that PPSH41 video. That's probably dropping next. Like I said, I'm hoping to take possession of it next week. Um, Let me know also if you enjoy this video essay format. Maybe I'll do another one if the mood strikes. 
And finally, I should have an update on my DP28 project soon, I hope. Okay, uh, until next time, love God and take care of the world. Peace.